The reading is taken from Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 to 13. It can be found on page 68. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Josh will never forget that night. He was eight years old when it happened. He can remember it so well because it was supposed to be his birthday party. But a few days before, his dad had come home with a serious look on his, hand, on his face from a meeting with the elders and his birthday party was cancelled. Instead, they had just days to get ready to move house. It was a strange time to bring home a new pet. But that's what his dad did and told them that they could look after him but that they couldn't keep him. So Josh and his two sisters took charge of feeding Larry, the lamb. Mum was busy trying out new recipes for bread without yeast. Dad was making plans And it came to the afternoon of the 14th, Josh's birthday. He was playing outside with the girls and then his dad appeared with a very serious look in his eyes and said, I'm afraid, children, it's time to say goodbye to Larry. His little sister burst into tears. His big sister looked at her dad and said, why? And their dad tried to explain because God says that that's what's needed if Josh isn't going to be killed tonight when the destroyer is sent through Egypt. Well, that got Josh's attention. It became very real at that point. He'd heard his mum and dad talking earlier in the week as they sat down to talk about an evening uh, uh, where they would do what they did on the 14th and they would roast the lamb and make sure that everyone had a piece and that there was none left over, that it was just right for them them as a family that the lamb would die in his place well as you can imagine that evening as josh began to understand he could be heard nagging his dad you won't forget will you dad you won't forget you won't you won't forget you won't forget the door frame you you won't forget dad and now as the evening wore on no matter how tired josh got he would not go to bed until he had watched his dad 
take the blood of the lamb that had been sacrificed and paint it around the door frame of the house. Only then could Josh sleep, knowing that the destroyer would see the blood and pass over their house. Now, hopefully you stayed with that attempted reconstruction. The point of it was to try to help to feel the dynamics dynamics of an ordinary family going about their business, and then they get this message about what God is going to do in the land of Egypt and how they need to have a sacrifice in the place of the firstborn son if they are not going to lose him in the middle of the night. It's a story of fantastic rescue from, God, uh, from Egypt, God taking his people out of Egypt into freedom. But it's also a story of God judging the whole land of Egypt, Israelites too, but teaching and providing that there is a way of rescue when he judges. Salvation and judgment side by side, a way of rescue. That is what we discover in Exodus chapter 12. It's a defining moment for the Israelite nation, as we know. It's still celebrated. Uh, verse 2 tells us it, it, why. I mean, it, it's, it's supposed to be the first month of the whole year from this point, Passover. And it's passed on generation to generation. And it becomes a symbol of other things, which we'll think about as well. So let me just read something from 1 Corinthians. When Paul is talking to a church, he's urging them, don't be so immoral. And he says to them, get rid of the old yeast, that you may be a new batch without yeast, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. We'll come back to that. He's expecting his readers to kind of tune in and go, oh, wow, oh, yeah, okay, I see the link. Hopefully we will by the end. Because for us to understand Passover, Exodus 12, will mean actually we will understand more deeply what Jesus Christ did for us when he died on a cross in our place. Two words summarize it, substitution and satisfaction. In the little story I told about Josh, the lamb was a substitute for him, wasn't it? Uh, just like in football, there's a switch between the players. A substitute comes on and the player goes off. So in the little story, the lamb swaps places with the boy. And it's a little story based on this true story about what happened uh, back in ancient e Egypt. Uh, I don't know whether you picked up the details about how there's quite a lot of detail about what kind of animal it's it's not just any old animal it's a male sheep or goat without defect up to a year old in the prime of life in other words no other reason to die other than to be the sacrifice and killed instead of the firstborn son dying instead of him to help us think about this this thing and how it all goes together supposing you've got so as you got a really rich friend with a Ferrari, I actually saw one being on, offloaded yesterday, sort of backed off this truck, I mean, a very excited young man uh, getting uh, used to starting up. But supposing you've got a friend who's just had a Ferrari delivered, or who's had one for years, and they take you out for a spin, and you, uh, you uh, go into Westfield, and this friend leaves you to look after the car, but leaves the keys in the ignition so you can listen to the radio. He's gone for a while, and you're twiddling your thumbs, and you think, do you know what? I'll just start it up. It'd be great to hear the engine purr. And, oh, well, well, I mean, it's been a while, and there'll be no harm just to have a little poodle around the car park. And I'm sure he wouldn't mind that much if I just took it one junction on the A40. And so you get it down on the road, and you put an 80, 90, 100 flash. And the speed camera's got you. And you think, oh boy, I'm in trouble now. Your friend, being a proper friend, doesn't mention to the police that you were driving without permission. But the police still throw the book at you. You're convicted of speeding and dangerous driving. You'll find thousands of pounds, money you don't have. And the only alternative is you end up going to prison. You're about to be justly punished. The only way that you won't be punished is if someone takes that punishment in your place as a substitute. Imagine your Ferrari-owning friend does just that. Not only does he 
forgive you. He also pays the fine for you, taking the punishment as it were. That would be wonderful grace and you'd be free to go because the price would have been paid by your substitute and because justice would now be satisfied. Do you see? Justice demands the price is paid and it has been by someone who's done it in your place. And that's the second part of of, of, uh, sacrifice is satisfaction. If you break laws, you deserve to be punished. But if the payment is made, then the law is satisfied. So too with God's justice. When I ignore God in his world, when I'm choosing evil rather than good, aren't I? When when we take his gifts of fun and food and family and friends and falling in love and fitness, when we take all those gifts and we just say, well, that's great, brilliant, thanks for those gifts. We're actually, no, I'm not going to say thank you for the gifts. I'm just going to enjoy them. I'm going to do my thing with them. I'm not going to relate to you, God. Well, when we do that, we're choosing a pathway that leads to selfishness, leads to damage to ourselves and other people, leads to damage to the world around us. That's what the Bible calls sin. And actually, for the Old Testament people of God, we might come to this in a few weeks' time. The children did it last week. There's a whole bunch of laws that he gave them to try and say, well, this is actually the right way to live. And if we measure ourselves against those laws, we all break them all the time. And as with paying a fine in court, there are two ways to satisfy God's justice. Either you and I take the punishment that we deserve or a substitute does it in your place satisfying God and the requirements of justice that's what happened at Passover through Moses and Aaron God warned the people in advance just as he'd done with all the other plagues he warned them that he was about to judge He was going to send a destroying angel to the land of Egypt. He warned not just the Israelites, he warned the Egyptians too. And he provided a way to be rescued if this lamb died instead. Now we've seen on our screens this week what it's like to lose a firstborn child. Just the agony the controlled and very dignified outpouring of grief from those two families in Nottingham. God warned that he was about to send on Pharaoh and the Egyptians the whole land a destroying angel that would lead to the death of every firstborn son. And we might think, well, hang on, Pharaoh is not a great guy. There's a lot of evil going on in Egypt. Did they deserve that? Cost your mind back, if you were here at the beginning of the year, to um, the very opening of the Bible, or you might know it, When God uh, creates the first humans, what does he warn them? He he puts them in this beautiful garden. He says, eat from any tree. I'm just going to give you one boundary, one law, which is don't eat from the tree in the center of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't grasp after being God like me. Let me decide what's good and evil rather than you do it in my stead. And yet that's what the first humans did and what I've been doing and you've been doing in our lives too. We grasp after what is God's. We want to be the ones deciding what's good and evil. And God warned that when we did that, he said, you will surely die. Which means when the first humans did that, what did they deserve? According to what God says. And spiritually, they did die. Their relationship with God was not right anymore. It was broken. But in his mercy, God let them live on. They sinned with a high hand in his face and God, there were consequences. God pushed them out of the garden. The relationship was fractured. But he gave them a chance to turn around, to live on, to come back, to know him again. 
Romans 6 verse 23 says the wages of sin is death for you and me too. Every day I live, every breath I breathe, I don't get what I deserve, which is death. I get mercy from God every day of my life. This next breath, God's being merciful to me a little bit longer and not giving me what I deserve. I realize that's a pretty surprising perspective on life if you've not thought about that before. But you see, that's the Bible story. I have, if I stand on my rights before God, I have no rights. My life is forfeit. But I live in a universe made by a God full of compassion and grace and mercy, and you do too. And so God has been extending his mercy to the human race from the very outset, delaying judgment day until a future day. It's coming, but it's a future day. He won't delay it forever, and every now and again, and, and Exodus 12 is one of those times, he does something in history, he, a bit like the other events of the Exodus, he doesn't need to keep doing it, he does it and makes sure it's recorded, so we know that he's serious when he warns us of judgment days, and that's what he did at Passover. Verse 12, on that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and will bring judgment to all the gods of Egypt. But there is a way to be rescued, a way to take refuge under the blood of a sacrificial lamb. Verse 13, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's why in, the, in my imagined story, little boy Josh would have been absolutely desperate. I don't think that's too far-fetched to think of, it, of little, little boys all through the Israelite community and whichever Egyptian families actually took notice of the warning, that actually they wouldn't have been able to sleep until they knew that the blood was around the door frame. Because it didn't matter whether you're Israelite or Egyptian, that was what God had said. You have to put your faith in a sacrifice that's been made for you. A substitute that satisfies God's requirement and then takes shelter under that sacrifice's blood. Perhaps it bothers you that an animal died as a substitute for a person. It's not a proper swap, is it? The book of Hebrews later in the Bible very much agrees with you. It talks about it as a massive visual aid and an expensive and difficult thing for a whole nation to do over and over in, in the end. But a, a, a massive visual aid of how difficult it is actually for human sin to be paid for, how wrong it is what I do completely different line, uh, a, a league than paying a fine for a friend. And it points actually all the way forward to the way that the only way a, a true satisfaction for God's justice can happen is if there's a true substitute, one who is, like the lamb, an unblemished human. Someone without defect who's willing to swap with me and with you. Uh, listen to what Peter, one of Jesus' best friends on earth, said. After three years of constantly seeing him in all kinds of situations, a lot of them very, very stressful, he said about Jesus, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Not even his words let him down. When John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And when did Jesus die? Do you remember? Not Good Friday back then. It's what we call it now. He died at Passover. This is the substitute, the human being without blemish that you need and I need, dying in our place for our sin. Jesus fulfilled this pattern of Passover in all kinds of ways. The, the lamb was to, uh, the family were to sit and to eat the lamb, that the lamb died for them. And there's a sort of symbol of one lamb for one family. He is the lamb who dies and does enough for us all. 
If you read, if you still got it open, our Exodus 12, you flip forward to verse 46, you'll find an, a little detailed instruction there. Don't break the bones of the lamb. What happened when the soldiers came to Jesus, crucified Jesus? Uh, they had a way of speeding up uh, the uh, process, which was to break their legs of the uh, people they were crucifying. But they found that there was no need because Jesus has already died. They left his bones unbroken, just like the Passover lamb. And that's why the Apostle Paul picks up this image and says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And do you see, it means that all who take refuge under his blood will be 100% safe on final judgment day, just like at Passover. It's not just knowing that he died, not just saying, okay, yeah, the lamb's died, okay, we've eaten it. It's actually taking refuge under his blood. We've got, as it were, to paint it around the door frames of our lives. To be people who go public with our confidence in Jesus' sacrifice. Who pray to him and say, Lord, what you did 2,000 years ago, would it be for me? Because Judgment Day is coming, God's warned us in advance, just like he did the Egyptians. He's true to his word. He rescued everyone who took shelter under the blood, but most of the Egyptians didn't. And verse 29, at midnight the Lord struck, and the result for Egypt was the unspeakable grief we saw in Nottingham this week. In every household in the land. How much worse for those families to know it wasn't something random. It was something they'd been warned about. They could have prevented if only they'd followed what God had said and taken refuge. Sorry, I wasn't planning to get emotional at that point, but that's how I feel about my friends and my family who don't trust in Jesus. I want to say that to the camera if any of them are watching. God has told us how to be rescued. He's paid it all for us. If only we trust in his beloved son who was crucified for you and for me. So I do want to urge you, if you've not ever done that, to make a personal response to Jesus. Before you put your head down on the pillow tonight, to make sure you've, you are taking refuge in him, trusting in him. If, if you're not sure how to do that, pick up one of these um, uh, booklets on the right-hand side just as you go through the internal door. There's a couple of them there on the right-hand side. And on page 10, there's a prayer that uh, will help you put into words a response of trust in what Jesus Christ has done. Uh, if you are watching online, if you go to the comments section just below the picture, that prayer is also there. For those of us who are trusting who are taking refuge in Jesus Christ. What about us? What should our response be to the God who just daily is patient with us, is gracious to us, gives us his mercy and love? Well, there's uh, an answer at the end of, uh, in verse uh, 27 of the section. Um, As Moses explains all that was going to happen, it says... Then the people bowed down and worshipped. The Israelites did just what the Lord Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. That should be our response, shouldn't it, to this God? Worship. Doing what he says because he's a good God. We do that in moments like this when we gather, not least. We do that through the Passover meal that Jesus adapted on the night that he was betrayed. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat this, this is my body which is broken for you. And took the cup and said, drink this, this is my blood which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. I'll repeat those words in a a short while. We'll have that opportunity today. That's how we worship. We trust this one who has died to rescue us from a lost eternity. 
We worship in moments as we gather. We worship actually in the whole of our lives as we do pay attention to what God says and follow it in our lives. What people, what kind of people ought we to be? Let me read again what the Apostle Paul said. Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast as you really are. For Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Yeast was a picture of um, sin, the way it, yeast goes through a whole batch of dough and spreads and, and it rises. That's how sin happens in a family, in a culture, in our lives. And so, just like they had to literally get rid of yeast from their bread, we're to get rid of sin from our lives. We can't do it on our own. We need the Holy Spirit. We need to keep praying for the Holy Spirit to enable us and fill us, to help us to put to death that which is going to destroy our lives. But that's the Christian life, to walk in obedience to God, to, with his help, the help of the Spirit, to uh, put to death the old. And remember as we do that, the person who calls us to walk that way through life, even when it's really hard to follow Jesus, the person who is calling us him is the one who loves us, who's always loved us, the one who sacrificed himself for us, the one who died as our Passover lamb, the one who lifts us by his resurrection, to be children of God and the one who is with us day by day by his Holy Spirit.